How could a hockey player who's been living the life playing for the most popular hockey team on the planet with beautiful women all around him and literally swimming in cash end up homeless and eating from dumpsters, you ask? Well, that's exactly what we'll talk about today as we discuss the life of Derek Sanderson. Who was Derek Sanderson? Derek Michael Sanderson, nicknamed Turk, is a former Canadian professional ice hockey centre and two-time Stanley Cup champion who helped shape the professional athlete culture in the 1970s. The two-time Stanley Cup champion set up Boston Bruins teammate Bobby Orr's historic overtime goal that clinched the 1970 Stanley Cup Finals, widely regarded as the best goal in National Hockey League history. In 598 games with five clubs over 13 NHL seasons, he had 202 goals, 250 assists, 911 penalty minutes, and a plus 141 rating. Sanderson scored his 32nd career shorthanded goal in the 1975-76 season, passing Toronto Maple Leaf center Dave Keon for the all-time league lead. For eight seasons, he held the record. Nearly half a century after his last appearance with the Bruins, Sanderson still holds the team record for most career shorthanded goals in the playoffs, which he shares with his longtime linemate, Ed Westfall. His 24 regular season shorthanded goals ranks third in club history, trailing only Brad Marchand and Rick Middleton. Sanderson was born in Niagara Falls, Ontario to Canadian Army Private Harold A. Sanderson and Caroline Hall from Scotland. Sanderson began playing hockey as a child, skating for hours on a scaled-down version of an NHL ring that his father built and maintained while his mother provided hot chocolate during breaks in the action. The rink stretched across two backyards of small cookie-cutter dwellings on lots given at low cost to troops like Harold upon their return home. Sanderson played junior hockey for the Niagara Falls Flyers of the Ontario Hockey Association in his hometown. During his stint with the Flyers, he was chosen to the second All-Star team in 1965-66, the first All-Star team in 1966-67, and he won the Eddie Powers Memorial Trophy as the OHA's leading scorer in 1966-67. Sanderson led the Flyers to the Memorial Cup Finals in 1964-65, where they defeated the Edmonton Oil Kings in five games. He then signed with the Boston Bruins in 1965-66 after four years in the OHA and made his professional debut with the Bruins in two games that season. Sanderson acquired a permanent roster place with the Bruins in 1967-68 after brief runs with the team the previous two seasons. In 71 appearances, the 21-year-old scored 24 goals and 49 points. He also accumulated 98 penalty minutes identifying himself as a difficult guy in the league. At the end of the season, Sanderson received the Calder Memorial Trophy as Rookie of the Year, an accolade that his teammate All had won the previous year. It is the only time in Bruins history that they've won the Calder Trophy on consecutive occasions. Despite being a standout scorer in junior hockey, Sanderson's role with the Bruins was limited to that of a third-line center in the midst of right-wing Ed Westfall and either Wayne Carlton or Don Marcotte on the left side. It wasn't long before Westfall and Sanderson established themselves as the league's most capable penalty-killing duo. If the Frank J. Selke trophy had been granted to the outstanding defensive forward during his Bruins tenure, it's not unreasonable to believe Sanderson would have received it more than once. Sanderson and the Bruins won the Stanley Cup in 1971-72, their second in three seasons, after winning the East Division title in successive seasons. He was also known for his numerous female partners and extravagant lifestyle, which included a Rolls-Royce automobile and a circular bed. He was named one of the sexiest men in America by Cosmopolitan, a topic of gossip columns, and a frequent guest on television talk shows. The Bruins met the St. Louis Blues in the Stanley Cup Finals after winning a series against the Rangers and sweeping the Chicago Blackhawks in the 1969-70 playoffs. Sanderson controlled the puck behind the Blues' goal line 40 seconds into the extra session, at which point defenseman Bobby Orr broke in from near the blue line. His brief pass was intercepted by Orr. The defenseman hit a quick wrist shot past goalie Glenn Hall to give the Bruins their first Stanley Cup in 29 years. You could also help us reach our very first ever 5,000 subscribers. We'd really appreciate it. On the league's 100th anniversary in 2017, fans chose the so-called flying goal as the best in league history. It also proved to be a watershed point in both players' careers. Sanderson signed the largest contract in professional sports history in the summer of 1972. 
Pat Anderson signed a five-year, $2.65 million contract with the Philadelphia Blazers, making him the highest-paid pro athlete in the world at the time. So they came to me and they said, what would it take to get Derek Sanders to leave the Bruins to go to that league? So I said, I don't know, if you make him the highest-paid athlete in the world, that might entice him. As part of the agreement, he received $600,000 in cash, which the Bruins declined to match. The remaining funds were to be distributed over a 10-year period. Sanderson suffered a back injury in a game against Cleveland on November 1st after slipping on a piece of paper on the ice. When he was cleared to return weeks later, club management insisted on his inactivity. It was commonly assumed that the team tried to get Sanderson to leave and invalidate his expensive contract, but his contract was bought out for $800,000 following the season. Sanderson traveled about from team to club, never staying with one for more than two seasons. He was traded to the St. Louis Blues. You think they want to get rid of you? Are you certainly? They want to pay the job. It's a lot of money, you know, when you pay a player $2,300 a day. The following season, after playing for the Rangers and scoring 50 points in 75 games, Sanderson achieved career highs in assists and points scored in a season in St. Louis with 43 and 67 respectively. But persistent knee and alcohol issues forced the Blues to transfer him to the Vancouver Canucks in 1976-77 in exchange for a first-round selection pick in 1977. Sanderson made a poor first impression on Canucks management before even playing a regular season game. Sanderson had 16 points in 16 games with the club before being demoted to the minors for disciplinary reasons. As in St. Louis, the front staff became irritated with his personal and health difficulties and released him at the end of the season. Sanderson signed as a free agent with the Pittsburgh Penguins in 1977-78. Before being released, he appeared in 13 games with the Penguins and eight more in the minors. He quit from the game after no takers came forward before the next season. The Turning Point his life didn't go wrong overnight, but instead he encountered a variety of personal obstacles throughout his career, some of which are typical of a professional athlete. To begin with, Sanderson is terrified of flying. Anyone who has to travel for employment faces this issue. Sanderson sought a fruitless remedy in counseling, which included the use of Valium. The medicine made him groggy and angry before a flight, but it also interfered with his performance. Sanderson still needed something to soothe his anxiety before a flight, even though the doctor had taken him off the Valium. That something was a couple of shots of scotch, until two shots weren't enough. He'd eventually fly hammered and have to be poured off the plane on the other end, as he put it. That was the beginning of Derek Sanderson's drinking problem, which teammate Bobby Orr addressed on several occasions. Sanderson was in denial at the moment. Sanderson turned to barbiturates to help with another issue that sportsmen face, discomfort. The medications, which included prednisone and cocaine, improved his hips but harmed his future. I had no money and no place to sleep when I arrived in New York, Sanderson writes. Clothing I was wearing, the only clothes I had, were unsuitable for even a bad New York night. I trudged over to Central Park, he continues. Cold and rain made the night terrible, but I knew all I needed was a spot to close my eyes and forget about my issues for a few hours. I took a discarded New York Times and sprawled out on a soggy bench, draping the newspaper over me like a blanket to be dry and warm. Sanderson recalls living under a bridge, eating out of garbage, and panhandling during his time in New York. I had relatives and friends, but I was too humiliated to ask for aid from anyone I knew. My ego simply wouldn't let me, Sanderson continues but I recognized I needed assistance. For the first time in my life, I was completely anonymous. My hair was dirty, I hadn't shaved in a while, and my clothing was filthy. People passing by didn't recognize me. It wouldn't have made a difference to me if they did. In 2012, Sanderson recovered, becoming the managing director of the sports group in Boston. His team worked with athletes and high net worth individuals, but he's not currently listed on the company's website. His second autobiography, Crossing the Line, the outrageous story of a hockey original, written with Kevin Shea, in which he discussed his stories in New York, was released in October 2012. I was at 13 detoxes, trying to get sober, but I always wanted to do it my way. If you enjoy this type of content, we highly recommend checking out part one of the series. Click the video on the screen.